Hi, I'm Tim, and welcome back to Watches Tonight. This evening we are discussing the first Zenith Daytona since at least the late 1990s, other watches that cloned popular models, and questions to ask before purchasing an independent brand watch. All of that and your viewer wrist chats tonight on Watches Tonight. Jumping into the live chat box, let's see who's joining us. Blue Shirt Buddha, Eddie Landsberg, Edward Ledden of Sweden, Alexi Samola of Finland, we got Marco Bernardi, we've got 121 Click Bezel. Guys, thank you for joining me. And remember, open a different window, keep me streaming, but thewatchbox.com, redesigned faster, bigger inventory, easier to search. Of course, I jump straight to Dibitun time pieces, but at the end of the day, with over 3,000 pre-owned and late model and vintage watches available, we have what you wish. So, let's talk about something while well, everyone filters into the room, and um, I'm assuming our graphics are working, right? Cool. Okay. The graphics are working. I'm going to take that as an article of faith. So here's how it works, guys. While I wait for you to filter in tonight, I'm going to talk about two things that came to mind recently. We haven't been able to travel as much with COVID, and I know a lot of you are world citizens. So you ever wonder when you step through customs and they ask you, do you have any bacterial cultures or snails? Have you ever wanted to just answer, why yes, I have my entire collection of exotic snails. Please take a look. I guarantee you that's never happened. Also, here in the United States, we have a, uh, I would say, robocall and spam call epidemic alongside the real epidemic. But if you have a cell phone, you already know that it's not uncommon to get called in the United States and told that there's either an arrest warrant out for you or a bounty hunter on the way. Well, this week I received both, so I am tentatively YouTube's most wanted man. All right, jumping back in the box, we got Terry C. from Toronto, Alan L., John Berkland joining in. We've got P.T., Dave Opencar, Zin fans represent M. Peters, Mr. Ninja, Monkey C. Production. And we've got Junior Johnson from Michigan and Abu Sadiq. Guys, welcome all. Let's talk about viewer wrist shots. I asked, you answered. And Anthony C. gets us rolling with the first one of the night with his... Omega Speedmaster, an enthusiasm for Hydrox cookies. I mentioned them last time, and apparently they are back in production. Fans of Urzatz Oreos rejoice. We've got Dana A, who impresses with his Patek Philippe Advanced Research 5550P Perpetual Calendar, and Bruno I of Sao Paulo, Brazil, who grills and chills with his IWC Pilot's Watch Chronograph. Andre G. from Orlando, Florida, sports the stunning H. Moser & C. Venturer XL Vanta Black. And Edward W. stuns with his Patek Philippe 5270p perpetual calendar chronograph. Guys, send your wrist shots to mondaymailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your wrist on my list. Okay, William Rizzo joining in from the Florida Keys, Lloyd Kerr, Joe Tyson from North Carolina, and of course we've got J.W. Wallace joining in from Knoxville, Tennessee. Very, very cool. Okay, the watch story of the last 72 hours, and I really don't think anything else is even in the same league, except maybe the discontinuation of the 5711, but the watch story of the last 72 hours has been the 2021 Zenith Chronomaster Sport, which proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that inevitably we all become our parents. And it's no surprise, this is where the Zenith Daytona started. Only back then, it truly was a Rolex Daytona in the early to late 1990s. So, I can't imagine that 32 years ago, when the Zenith El Primero and the Rolex Daytona first met, either one of them would have believed that someday we'd see this kind of design convergence. So here are my thoughts on Zenith's most important chronograph since 2017's DeFi El Primero 21. And this is a big one. I want to know what you think about this new Chronomaster Sport, because this is a controversial watch. Not because of what's inside, but because of what's outside. I would even go so far as to say this is the most controversial Zenith since Terry Nataf was at the helm of Lelok's most famous watch brand. 
Okay, guys, we got Robert N. saying, lame attempt to capitalize on the old Daytona. Already chiming in, I can see you've got strong opinions. j Surf joining from Adelaide, Australia, and Abdul R. joining in from Germany. We've got Dave Demusio asking, is he wearing a mask in a room by himself? Frequently asked question on this show. No, we've got a team in here. It's a collaborative effort. It is a studio, not a great one, but it is a studio. So first, let's be honest about this new Zenith Chronomaster. Literally every news outlet that covered the new Chronomaster observed that it bears an uncanny resemblance to the current Rolex Daytona, the 116 ln And there is absolutely no doubt about this. At the same time, there has been a fevered anxiety in some online circles about even admitting that the two sport chronographs look like 90% the same. And I think that's holding us back because crazed minutia like colored registers and pump pushers are being cited to contradict what our naked eyes can tell us in an instant. Sean, cycle between those two one more time. Guys, it doesn't come any more overt than this. And I'm not calling the Zenith a bad watch or a bad design either. I'm just saying, let's embrace the obvious so we can talk about all the things that Zenith gets right with this watch. And there are many of them. Because if you really can't see the Rolex intent here, then you probably think that the Zoti SR9 looks nothing like a Porsche Macan. Can we jump back and forth between those one more time? Chinese Porsche? Porsche Porsche. See what I'm saying? Oh yeah, they changed the headlights and the grill does this instead of this and the wheels are this big rather than, no, yeah, it's the same thing. And it's exactly that way with the new Corona Master. But clinging to that kind of denial makes it so hard to appreciate this watch on its own terms and there's a lot to like and I do like this watch. First, the new Zenith is objectively just a good watch. The Daytona is a good watch. It looks good, it feels good, it's the right size, it's the right watch for the moment and at $10,000, this particular timepiece is priced right compared to the $13,150 Rolex, and it picked a good role model. This is a design unlike the DeFi Extremes of the 2000s and possibly the DeFi El Primero 21 of today. This is a design that's going to age really well. At 41 millimeters, it's perfect for a modern sports chrono. It's not too thick. It's 100 meters water resistant, which is kind of the new industry standard, which means unlike a lot of past chrono masters, you can actually take this one swimming. Third, the caliber 3600 is, at last, finally, the El Primero 2 for which we have pined for decades. 60 hour power reserve instead of 50, hacking seconds for the first time, and a striking 10th complication more on that in a moment, that makes it actually possible with the naked eye to read one-tenth of a second on a one-tenth of a second capable chronograph. Again, the price, fantastic. Don't want to pay 10 grand? Get it on a strap. Get it on a strap for 9,500. And this is where the watch really comes into its own and looks a whole lot less like the Rolex. First, because the Rolex on a strap looks nothing like this. Uh, second, because you can't get the Rolex on a water-resistant sporting strap. And third, because Zenith made the conscious decision not to have a conforming end link inserted between the lugs the way you have on a Rolex Daytona to integrate the Oyster Flex or the leather strap. But to have this nice textile arrangement that's handsome, straight, barred, and distinct gives the watch a little bit more of its own character. Now, sixth. The new Chronomaster mostly continues a previous Zenith tradition of modeling new products on existing market leaders. Now, this is not something new, so I'm not upset about it. It's something Zenith has done for a long time. We know that Zenith has always been discussed as a sort of iconic watch nerd brand, but unlike Giger LeCoultre, which is frequently mentioned alongside it, it has no design icon. JLC has the reverso. But the real comparison to Zenith would be the Memovox. The Memovox isn't a shape. It isn't a look. It's a movement. It's an alarm watch. It's a complication. And Zenith has always been a brand that, like that Memovox, is defined more by what's inside the watch than what's outside the watch. And this is the real Zenith comparison to JLC. Zenith has always been the other watchmaker's watchmaker, meaning Zenith creates movements that are fantastic, often for other brands that use them well in handsomely styled products. But Zenith itself never had a truly enduring multi-decade design that stuck around to be the face of the brand. 
And if you remember the early 1990s and the so-called DeLuca series, named after their Italian importer that ordered the models, well, these later examples from the 90s, the first ones were in the late 80s, but these later examples from the 90s were almost a mirror image of the 1990s Daytona. So Zenith was doing it even back then. This is not an evolution. It's not an innovation even in concept. And frankly, a lot of folks love those old DeLucas. I love those old DeLucas. Those are watches that are fun to own and hugely collectible. So is it possible that Zenith can get a total pass for basically aping the Rolex look? I'm going to say probably. And I'm also going to say this, that in the last six years, Zenith has borrowed an awful lot from Hublot and from Tag Heuer. And a lot of times the watch collector fraternity has appreciated what's inside the movement, but not the fact that all three main LVMH brands seem to homogenize their style. So on this basis, I think it's actually great that the new Chronomaster doesn't look like a 44 millimeter open dial oversized sports watch. In other words, it's good that we're finally exercising the ghosts of late 2000s Hublot from a mainstream LVMH watch, from a watch that is not called Bulgari, because remember, Bulgari has its own management, which is why none of its watches ever looked like tags or Hublots. Zenith, by getting back in touch with its history and heritage of adopting successful designs from other brands, is actually being more true to itself in the process. Now let's see what you guys have to say. Jumping into the box, we've got Junior William Logan Hall joining, saying originally from Chattanooga. Let's see what you're saying. Oh, my chat box is moving fast. It's so hard to keep up with your comments. Terry C saying, no one would have blamed Zenith for releasing a blue dial watch for the new collection, but no, they chose to release white black that evoke images of the Daytona. It's a bold move that paid off, and I'm gonna agree with you there. Controversial to copy a successful design, but these really are some of the best looking Zenith watches in a while. Right here we have Anthony Napoli saying, Rolex Hysteria has ruined watch collecting. That's why independent brands are where we're going next. And I'm hugely excited about that topic. Also right here, we've got Robert N saying, Tim, please teach Mike how to say the proper name of the brand abbreviated JLC. You mean it's not Jaeger LeCoultre, huh? And please, if you're a client of the brand and I just offended you and you call us and you buy watches, you can call it whatever you want. <laughs> There's no approved pronunciation for clients. Right here I can see we've got eh, eh, eh saying that black dial Zenith looks good. And we've got Rooted Rotor saying, I like this watch. I might pick it up in two years for 5,000 second hand. Indeed, isn't that the real difference between a Zenith and a Daytona. And then right here, we've got Nate Dog saying, get it at a discount from your AD for 7,000. I'm not sure I see it sinking that low just yet, maybe in a few years, but yeah, with LVMH brands in general, discounts out of dealers are a real thing, especially if you go into boutiques, that's probably the boutique where you're most likely to get a discount other than Langa. And then right here, we've got Watch Lounge saying, hey guys, hey Tim, wearing a Tudor Pelagos, love the new Zenith. And then we've got Baxmeister saying, in the words of Oscar Wilde, imitation is the serious form of flattery that mediocrity can pay to greatness. And we've got Abdul saying, the white dial on the blue strap does look great. Maybe on a NATO would look even better. And then we've got 121 click bezel saying, I like Jorn's way of cheating the one tenth of a second. Indeed, Jorn has gone all the way to one one hundredth of a second. So he has one upped. But then again, there is a big price delta there. And we've got Jeff joining in from Boston. We've got Andres A greeting us from the island of Cyprus in the Mediterranean. And we've got William Rizzo saying, I'm wearing the CW Super Compressor. Brick Lane joining in live. We've got Adam Wright saying, overlapping subdials. Daytona doesn't have that. True, there are differences. If we go back to the Chronomaster for a second there, Sean, you can see that there are obvious differences if you really look close. The lugs are beveled. There's no crown guard. The pump pushers are not screw downs. And of course, we've got that A386 style overlapping multicolor register system at center. So make no mistake, they're safe from Rolex's copyright lawyers, but all the same. We know. All right, 
Viewer wrist chats number two. Abdul R is in the German winter. And he's in the German winter with his Tudor Heritage Black Bay Red. Looking good against the snowdrifts. Very, very cool. We've got Jens F of Hamburg, Germany. Chillin with a domestic brew and a lovely Dornier flying boat right on there. He's also got his Vempa Flieger, so he's got a flying boat beer and a watch to match. We've got Alan W. of Lebanon sending his regards with a now classic Mercedes-Benz R129 SL and FP Journe Chronomet Bleu. George B. of Northern Ireland braves the ice with his polar dial Rolex Explorer 2 and Kaz O. with his Chapek Antarctic Abyss Blowing my mind with color and innovation. Guys, if you're going to do an integrated bracelet or strap sports watch these days, do something like that, which is just blue sky imagination, or in this case, blue abyss. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on these pixels. Jumping back into the box, we've got Andreas asking, where do we send the wrist shots? Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. And you can see your analog on my digital. We've got Enrique C saying Mercedes Benz R129. Hmm. Looks like he's not quite as much of a fan. I'm a huge fan of those. I would love to own an R129 SL600 from like the last year, 99, with like the full hardtop with the glass roof. That would be so sweet. The only thing I don't love about those cars is unless you're getting like an early SL300 with a straight six, it's damn hard to find a real manual transmission. We've got Phil McCracken joining in from South Carolina and Stefan Schweitzer joining in from British Columbia. We got the Watch Lounge saying, Lucky for me, if and when I'm ready to pick one up, I already have a buying history with a Zenith AD. And then we've got Ian SPA saying, everything timed is using tenth of a seconds. Brick Lane saying, Edward Pump Style Pushers feel good in action. They look good too. And then Brick Lane saying, the R129 was the last of the proper Mercs. Dude, I got to agree. We got... Saad joining from Saudi Arabia. Thank you for staying up super late into the wee hours of the morning with me. All right, let's talk about Clone Wars. Watches that blurred the line between admiration and theft. It's not just the new Zenith Chronomaster. The original carbon copy was the 1938 Hamilton Otis. Oh yes, we're going there. A watch that committed Grand Theft Roto against the JLC Reverso of the time. Now, JLC finally cornered and killed this knockoff in 1940. Design homage is one thing, but Hamilton crossed a red line by actually violating an engineering patent by copying the rotating case, and that was the seed of its destruction. And JLC was eventually able to not precisely kill the watch, but force Hamilton into a licensing agreement that it decided wasn't worth the trouble. So, in the end, the Hamilton Otis met its fate. 2016 brought us a Nautilus. We're talking about the 5711 being discontinued. Fortunately, the folks at Piaget have the Polo S ready and waiting to go. Your substitution for the 5711 and available in stock right now, preferably with a discount. Folks got very sore about this at the time, but there's probably a greater disparity in design between the Polo S and the 5711 than there is between the Zenith Chronomaster and the Daytona. Those, those are actually closer together design-wise than the Polo S and the 5711. Uh, I will also say this, when the watch gained an ADLC bezel, it became a little bit less Nauta-like. So the Polo S, ultimately a worthwhile watch, considering you can get it like, I don't know, a tenth the price used of a used 5711, maybe like a ninth the price used. But again, at the time, it was very, very obvious. They took the shape, they took an integrated bracelet that had no history in the Polo collection. They even copied the design of the bezel and the striations of the dial. It was pretty explicit, it was pretty overt, and at the time, honestly, I had a lot of fun watching the outrage bubble up on watch social media, and this was like, Five years back, before watch social media had metastasized into like a cancer on the community. So that's saying something about how energetic people were about this thing back in the day. I'll also say Chopard joined the bandwagon in 2019 with the Alpine Eagle. Now, while they like to say that it's really a recreation of the 1980 to 1981 St. Moritz, it's also important to note that that watch in its day was a Nautilus copy. So 
great watch, and like the new Chronomaster, a really fine option to pick if you want a good watch at a reasonable price. This thing, unfortunately, gets a bum rap for being a bandwagon watch, which it absolutely is and was. It's also nicely priced, technically adept, well-powered, with a manufacture movement that's both a 60-hour and a chronometer, hugely water-resistant, gorgeously dialed, handsomely hand-finished, and the steel itself is a little bit harder than the 316 you'll get on a Nautilus or a Royal Oak, so it's more scratch-resistant. I really like this watch, and when you see it in person, it changes your opinion, but at first glance, my god, you know what they were trying to go for. Okay, 2020's Casio GA2100 became the year's most surprising homage to the AP Royal Oak and Royal Oak Offshore. I don't think anyone saw that coming for a few hundred bucks. And I'm okay with this one due to the price disparity and what's obviously a loving and semi-satirical intent of the design. I don't think anyone thought they would throw a fastball by Audemars Piguet's attorneys. I'll also say that it's not new either, as the Royal Oak has a long history of emulation dating back to the legendary Bulova Royal Oak of the late 70s and early 80s. And just to squash the rumor before it starts growing in our chat box, no, the design was not offered to Bulova first. That's a myth. They simply saw good design and found a way to capitalize for a lot less money. It's amazing what you can get away with across the Atlantic. All right, jumping into the box right here. Um, the cancer, as Tim said, it is perfectly is why I took a pause from watches a year ago. Yet my advice, aside from some really niche social media accounts, just stay away from most of it. It's the same stuff. It's a terrible caustic echo chamber of emulation and it's just where imagination goes to die. Like I, I think the best thing you can do is get involved in like niche communities on old school message boards and chats where you still find really high-level discussion of the stuff that matters and sets watches apart from each other, where you can find people who are genuinely excited about, you know, the likes of Moritz Grossmann or HYT, or you can find people who are into Sartori, or you can find people who are really into Menaze, people who are really interested in Hajime Aseoka, people who are really interested in Acrivia, people who are not necessarily just interested in whatever steel sports watch from 2.5 brands is cool today. So those old message boards are really the places to go. These days, watch you seek, time zone, watch pro site, they're actually becoming cool again precisely because they take you away from Instagram and Twitter. And frankly, let's see, Pinterest, Snapchat, what else? Frankly, this is social media here on YouTube. Hopefully, I'm not damning myself, but all the same, I gotta recommend, if you feel burned out on watches, and a lot of people tell me they do, go back to old school message boards. They're waiting for you. Okay, viewer wrist shots number three. Les O from Dublin, Ireland showcases the loom on his 1998 Omega Seamaster GMT. Nadav S. of Israel shares his anniversary gift Cartier Santos Large in his Maserati Ghibli sedan with clock. Simon H. showcases his first Rolex, a 2004 Explorer II that spawned an entire Rolex collection. Ari F. wins our pure photography prize for the night with his incredible Grand Seiko SBGM 221. And Derek W. captures his newly arrived Rolex Milgauss Z Blue, my favorite, and La Pavoni Espresso Machine. Two passions, one man, one wrist. Well done. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Now, jumping into the box real quick, we've got Enrique saying, Constantin Chaikin is my high personally. I think he's really cool. And not just the Joker watch, there's some really neat stuff. Uh, there's a Hajira watch that is probably his best purely styled piece. A lot of his watches are hugely involved, but the Hajira watch is my favorite. Super clean, good looking, very rare, and if you're not into the clown faces, that's a reminder that he's got a huge model line of watches that are not the clown, not the Joker, not Santa Claus. But on that count, stay tuned, because I might have something to announce in a few weeks. Right here, we've got Edward Ledden saying, Tim, please get William Messina on the show one day. One of the best guys in the industry. Absolutely true. You want no bullshit? That is his brand. Zero bullshit. None whatsoever. Uh, Messina, of course, is a pen name of William Rur, who also runs Messina Lab, and now is as much as 
you know, a designer as much as a collector. But he is going to be the guy who calls out fashionistas, uh, people who are only interested in social media for its own sake, people who are only interested in watches for the sake of money, and auction houses that are not absolutely upright. He is one cool dude. I've met him. He's a cool dude. He's a breath of fresh air. It's too bad we don't get to see more of him. Right here, we got Mark S. joining in from Brooklyn. We got all sorts of friends in the box. And we've got S. saying, the watch game is changing. And then we've got Elliot Drinks Water saying, Tim and Brodinke are the only social media personalities worth my time. Honestly, I'm, I'm flattered to be mentioned alongside them. I, I make fun of them. I've had tremendous times at their expense. But all the same, they are still an important research and a sort of center or hub point for the community. So I want Hoding Key to succeed. Uh, I just want them to be a whole lot less self-aware and more approachable. Jumping into questions to ask before buying an independent brand watch. Of course, we now have the DB28 with two faces. It is literally a watch with two sides and a tourbillon and two dials. All of that built the DB way, which means it's going to be super rare, fairly priced for what it is, and technically proficient. Here's the thing. There are many independent brands today. So how do you choose? All the watches are cool. This is one of the neatest things you'll see today. So this is my guide to asking questions before you buy an independent brand watch. Previously, I highlighted interest in independent brands as a major collector trend that we're going to see advancing in 2021. But the brands and their products run the gamut from rock solid to real risks on multiple levels. Here are the questions you should ask before buying an independent brand watch. And we're going to start with the brand's track record. Age is a big one because just surviving means they've figured out how to weather ups and downs in the economy, they figured out how to change with the times. They must, by this point, have figured out how to handle service because watch is going back for service right now. That's sort of the chickens coming home to roost for all watch brands as huge volumes have been made. And independent brands now, some of them are so new, they're seeing their first watches come back for service as we speak. So if a brand has been around since 1985, like Sven Anderson in Geneva, or since 1997, like Erwerk, or since 1999, like Richard Mille, F.P. Journ, or 2002, like De Betun, you know they have two decades or more of experience actually running a company, surviving bad times, supporting their old products, and interacting with the community of collectors. This is always a good sign. Moser has it. Stability. Part of the brand's track record is responsible ownership. MELB has provided real money, development dollars, and attention to the service side of things over the last nine years since they took over Moser. Moser has it. Jorn has it. Laurent Ferrier, not so much. They've had four CEOs since their founding, and they just got another one in 2019. So pay attention to these sort of things. Financial lifelines. How solid and solvent is your independent brand? We talked about Moser. They've got that MELB behind them. It's a mid-sized group that also owns a couple of other brands and distribution agreements, and it has old Audemars Piguet watch industry and Wharton business experience running it, which means Moser is on a solid financial footing. I should also mention that RM has AP money, as Audemars Piguet is and has always been a stakeholder in Richard Mule's company. Since Richard Mille is also an important customer of Audemars Piguet, there's an additional financial stake in its success beyond its ownership stake of about 15%. So that inspires confidence. Grubel Forsey, two different lifelines. The company Completime is wholly owned by Stephen Forsey and Robert Grubel, and it produces movements, engineering solutions, all sorts of componentry for the entire watch industry. Anyone can go to Completime and get an entire movement engineered, or just a balance, or just a regulator. The point is they have a revenue source that serves the entire industry that is completely independent of how many watches Grubel Forsey say, sells each year. They've also got an investment of about 20% from Richemont, which means Richemont, which 
rarely plays in the $150,000 to $3 million watch market. Sure, it's got some, but in general, that's not its bag. Richemont has a stake in the survival and success of Grubel Forcey, and if necessary, a cash injection would probably never be far off. So between Complotime and Richemont, they are absolutely rock solid, even if in one given year, the market for watches averaging half a million dollars is down. Jorn. And for that matter, Romain Gautier. Both of them have sold a significant share to Chanel, which is a huge luxury group that uses those companies to burnish its image, and in the case of Gautier, to provide extensive engineering for Chanel brand watches, which means both F.P. Journe and Romain Gautier remain primarily independent, but they have the best kind of sugar daddy, the kind that writes the check and never asks where it goes. Also, I would have to say that if you want to look at companies that don't have an obvious financial lifeline, you look at, for example, Laurent Ferrier, where a, a large shareholder who's made himself the CEO is really the only backstop they've got against bad times or down sales. Uh, Long und Heine, a great company that builds, can we go full screen with that? This is probably the most gorgeous watch you're going to see on the show. It's the Georg. It was their first shaped watch. It came out about five years ago. This is as good as finishing gets. Some may match, none surpass. But again, if you're buying a watch from this company, uh, it's basically a family-level firm, and both Long and Heine, the founders, have left. So it's worth asking some questions about the longevity of this company before you commit and write the six-figure check. And then there's Moritz Grossmann, which, to its credit, survived the downturn of 2008, but it doesn't appear to have a large corporate patron the way Jorn and Gautier with Chanel or... Grubel Forcey with Richemont clearly have a backstop if they need it. These are questions to ask because watches put you in it for the long haul. Watches are generational products. Local service affiliates. How well established is your independent watchmaker globally? And this is important because FP Journe has global service affiliates. Moser has service affiliates in its major markets in Europe, in Latin America, in Asia. In North America, they're set up to do service. Richard Meal is as well. If your watch doesn't have to take a trip overseas, in general, the turnaround is going to be a lot quicker, and it's going to be more fluid in all cases to deal with a service center in your own country speaking in your own language than it is to work remotely with others who may not see eye to eye or speak word to word. I will also say that De Betun, MBNF, and Moritz Grossmann. Again, those are some brands that do not have comprehensive local service affiliates. Ask your brand before you buy, can I have this watch serviced in my country, or at least on my continent? And if the answer is no, that's an important consideration. Now, warranty. Here's the thing. In the industry, we're beginning to see five years emerge as the standard. I believe Rolex and Omega really helped to move the ball and establish that. But in the world of independent horology, it is still rare to see a five-year warranty. So De Batoon, Erwerk, Laurent Ferrier, Moritz Grossmann, MBNF, they are all ultra high-end, but they are all two-year warranties. And again, right now, you can buy an Oris with a 10-year warranty. Jorn is a two-year warranty unless you register the watch, in which case it could be three, or you buy the Elegant, which uniquely among Jorn watches has a five-year warranty, but that's a quartz watch, remember. A Crivia celebrated the hottest new name, Recep Recepi, but three-year warranty. So keep in mind, if you need something three years and three months later, you might have to pay out of pocket. These are good things to know in advance. HYT, because they have such a bizarre method of telling time and people have qualms about buying such a thing, they were one of the first back in 2015 to commit to a five-year warranty, and that is a big difference maker. You could buy this watch, own it for three years, sell it, and still tout two years of warranty. And that is one reason you want to see an extended warranty. It gives you the opportunity to own the watch, feel fulfilled, enjoy it for a period, and still sell it at something resembling top market value. Warranty is not just about getting help down the line. Sometimes it's about rotating your collection. Henschel. Henschel of Hamburg is fascinating. Because not only do the watches all come with a five-year warranty, but you can purchase a premium package that includes a service 
that then carries a two-year service warranty, effectively extending it to seven years. But they have something that no other brand I've ever experienced offers, and that is a three-month run-in period. For three months, because a watch that's freshly assembled and regulated needs to be run in before it stabilizes, you wear the watch for three months and then you send it back to Hamburg and they regulate it again so that it becomes regular once it's broken in, it's regulated again. So you technically get three months of running in, five years of warranty, and optionally a service plus two years of service warranty. That is cool. I'll also mention that Bayat Haldeman absolutely slays them all, by the way, how cool is that watch? That's like an exit watch, the last watch you ever buy. Flying Torbion H1, but lifetime warranty. This is the kind of thing that happens when your watchmaker is building dozens of watches a year, not hundreds. Lifetime warranties become at least possible, so always ask and do your research. Idiosyncrasies. Some watches are weird. Devon Treads are a really good example of that. They're also huge. Is the watch you're thinking about absolutely huge? Because this is going to limit the market for resale. If you want to move out of that watch in the future, it's going to be harder to do so if the watch is either weird, huge, or both. Also, is it nationally themed? I found that people who buy these ultra-nationalist, American-themed, Russian-themed, Brazilian-themed watches later have trouble getting out of them because they're just too particular. And if the watch is a novelty piece with limited appeal, like the Richard Mille RM69 Erotic Tourbillon, someone else might not think this is as funny as you do. So be prepared. These are the kind of problems people have when they start running into almost unique independent brand products. Now also ask this, if the brand failed tomorrow, would a credible general master watchmaker, not a brand specific guy, but would a master watchmaker be able to service this Cabistan vertical winch tourbillon? In other words, if the factory shut tomorrow, could anyone make parts for that fusee and properly service the watch? That's a legitimate question to ask when the watch is designed to last hundreds of years, but businesses often have a more finite shelf life. And I would also say this, with Richard Mille and F.P. Journe, community is huge. Community is a big consideration that you need to take into account. Is there a group of people who collect these watches? Do they have online forums? Do they have in-person social circles? Does the brand support the community with events and get-togethers? That is the single biggest argument in favor of getting a Richard Mille watch. Every single person I've spoken to who bought an RM New told me that the events, the doors that open, the opportunities, and the society around the brand, for all of the posturing on social media, the scene is actually cool, memorable, and worthwhile. And that, in my opinion, is something to consider because it's also true in large part for FP Journe. Now, resale value. This is a function of all the foregoing properties. As with Jaguar, depreciation is not a problem if you plan to keep it for life. But should you ever sell that 2012 Jaguar XKRS in French Racing Blue, chances are you're going to have to pay the market rate, and that becomes a $130,000 car depreciated to about $45,000. Be ready for that to happen if you're getting into a brand that is so far outside of the mainstream that it's impossible to establish what the aftermarket carrying capacity might be for one of those watches used. And because I asked and you answered viewer wrist shots for. Rick R and Hannah the Cat share space with the Rolex GMT Master II Pepsi Jubilee bracelet. Nick M wears his heirloom Rolex Datejust 41 in honor of his father. Nice watches and wheels shot. We got Severin G of Cologne, Germany, sporting a 1975 Doxa with Camillo, the Italian water dog. We've got Ralph P and his Panerai PAM 352 who overlook the golfing greens of the Emirates Golf Course in Dubai. And we've got Guillermo B of Mexico who's in Alcapoco with his Tudor Heritage Black Bay at sunset. Gorgeous shot, Guillermo. Well done. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Of course, tmasso at thewatchbox.com is your one-stop shop. Purchase questions, pricing questions for anything you see on any Watchbox platform. Reach out directly to me, tmasso at thewatchbox.com. And don't forget to comment and subscribe and join me on Facebook, Talking Time with Tim Masso. It is the after party to watch us tonight. Guys, thanks so much. 
Big action in the box tonight. Love the comments. I always read them all after the fact, even if I can't always respond to all of them in situ. Time out, Tim out, Sean out, and thanks for logging on.